In these uncertain economic times, it's easy to be worried about protecting your wealth, your hard-earned savings, and your family's financial future. Plunging interest rates, the devaluating dollar, and political unrest constantly threaten what you have worked hard to earn and all that you own. That's why now it's more important than ever to protect your assets and have the money you need to make your dreams come true. Welcome to the Global Wealth Fortress Report with successful global entrepreneur and wealth preservation expert, Joel Nagel. Joel's helped thousands of people just like you protect what you have so that you can make even more and make your every dream come true. So, sit back and enjoy Joel Nagel's offshore expert advice on how you can live the good life at a great price, where the sun never sets on your financial fortress. Hello, this is Carib Carter Clues. Welcome to Joel Nagel's Global Wealth Fortress Report. This is the weekly podcast where you hear from America's number one asset protection attorney about how best you can protect your assets, which is vitally important right now, as each of you knows. Uh, and this week, Joe, you are in Portugal, right? So let's talk Portugal. Great, great. It's good to be with you, Carter. And uh, yeah, I am. It's it's kind of late here, but uh, it's always good to be with you. And uh, I, I love Portugal. It's a country I, I didn't really know that well till about a decade ago when my oldest daughter um, decided to do a semester of college. She studied abroad. And while she was abroad, my wife and I went to see her. And, uh, you know, it sort of started a, a love affair. We, we are now residents of Portugal. Uh, it's one of the uh, sort of plan B or plan C uh, places that we have. And we've really gotten to know the country well. And uh, I'm here this week. My youngest daughter has her school break from Austria, combining it with a little, a little business. Um, Good. And, Good. Uh, yeah, it's the beautiful weather here. It's early spring. The cherry blossoms are blooming. It's uh, 60s. It was almost 70 degrees today. So it's a really nice uh, time of year to be here. That's fantastic. I, I've got to ask you a question that every that I think ever since I was in like 10th grade, every time I've looked at the map and saw Portugal, I've said to myself, if I ever meet a Portuguese, I, this is the question I'm going to ask them. How in the hell did a country the size of my thumb end up owning half the known world at one <laughs> point? And what that is, what is it about those people? Well, you know, historically they were they were great explorers. They were they were shipbuilders, explorers. Um, you know, they were uh, incredible um, military thinkers. Um, you know, nobody has ever been able to conquer Portugal. No, oh, really. Uh, Napoleon tried, um, you know, and um, the Spaniards tried and uh, the Portuguese used the strategy where they just retreated, 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 retreated uh, all the way to the Atlantic coast, which for them is their western border. And when the enemy supply lines got, you know, really weak and and uh, they were low on supplies and food, then they counterattacked and, you know, demolished them. Meanwhile, they had a tremendous shipbuilding uh, industry and uh, literally, you know, as you know, they were the earliest explorers. They explored all over the world. And you're right. They have uh, even today, you know, you find Portuguese. It's one of the most spoken languages in the world. Um, Portugal itself is just a little country, but, uh, yeah. you know, Brazil is about the size of the United States. That's right. Um, you have uh, other countries around the world. Where Portuguese is the the uh, primary language, like Angola and um, I don't know, Team East Timor. <laughs> there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of countries. Uh, I don't. I can't think of them off the top of my head. But uh, you did quite a pretty a, good job. You did a pretty good job right there. I forgot. Macau, I think Brazil. Macau, for example, and right, you know, right there on the doorstep of Hong Kong, that's a Portuguese colony. So remarkable, remarkable. So let's talk about. I'm going to say something that you may say. You disagree with 100%. Folks, this show is, Joel and I have been knowing each other a long time. So we're very comfortable with each other. So what you see on this show is what you get. So I'm going to say something. You may disagree with 100%, but I got to be honest with you. 
I think the way it, things are in the United States now, particularly with the confiscatory taxes, 40 to 50 percent, that's going to continue rising, the outrageous inflation. I think anyone who doesn't at least consider getting out and moving offshore really needs to have a serious talk with themselves. And I think Portugal might be one of those places that they consider. What do you think? I mean, you've spent a lot of time there. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, moving offshore in and of itself doesn't do away with your tax responsibilities, right? I mean, yeah. the U.S. is one of the few countries in the world that taxes you based on your citizenship, not based on residence. Most other countries tax you not on citizenship, but on residence. So, for example, if you're a Frenchman and you're just fed up with high taxes, you know, you could move to some Caribbean island and the French aren't going to tax you at all. Wow. That's not the way it, that's not the way it is with the U.S. The U.S. is is going to continue to tax you. But there is something called the foreign earned income exclusion, which eliminates tax on the first about one hundred and seven thousand dollars that you earn. Now, in the past, it was very difficult to move outside the country and still earn income, you know, because the foreign earned income exclusion doesn't apply to investments. It doesn't apply to retirement, pensions, Social Security, any of that stuff. You have to, it has to actually be earned income. But now in this digital nomad age that we live in, yep. you know, virtually anybody can, you know, I mean, I think if there was any silver lining in the whole COVID, um, you know, affair that we've had the last two and a half years, people realize that, you know, they don't have to sit in an office to yes. be able to do the job. And if you're working remotely, what difference does it make if you're in the suburb of, of your home city or you're halfway around the world, right? I mean, oh, absolutely. You know, commuting's commuting. I mean, when my daughters had uh, their school closed down, uh, in, in Europe, my wife and I decided to move back to the States for a few months. And, you know, my daughters weren't happy about getting up at two o'clock in the morning um, because that's the time they had to get up to, to go to virtual school. But right. they were able to do it. And people are, are doing it with employment as well. So, yeah, I think in, in that regard, Portugal is a strong contender. I'm, I'm really quite amazed. And, and maybe, it, maybe it is because it's a small country it, it's it has an entrepreneurial edge to it there's a lot of like energy vim vigor whatever you, really? however, you want, however you want to call it i mean you know for example crypto i know we, we talked about that last week right uh the, the the portuguese have basically taken the position that bitcoin for example is like money so if money goes up and down in value you don't get taxed on money right if if the right. dollar all of a sudden next month is worth more than the euro, it's not like we pay a tax on that. But, you know, the the U.S. treats Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as a good. Right. So it's the same as gold. So if I buy it today and then I use it in commerce tomorrow or or just outright sell it, I'm going to pay capital gains tax on the difference. Portugal, right. no, there is no such thing as capital gains tax on, on cryptocurrencies. So you're seeing a lot of young people who are in that, you know, genre moving here, starting businesses in the crypto space, miners, um, people starting ICOs and, you know, <clears throat> initial coin offerings, which is kind of like startup wow. companies in the crypto space. So you have that at the young end of the spectrum. And then people my age, our age, I should say, and older you know, there's there are a lot of programs. I for, think I fall under the older. It, uh, <laughs> for investors and retirees. I mean, yeah, so they're yeah. really trying hard to attract people uh, yeah. from all ends of the spectrum. And uh, it seems to be working. I mean, um, like I said, you, 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 you walk around here and you just everybody has a little extra spring in their step. And, uh, you know, it's things are things are moving here. Let me ask you this. Can you. If you went into a store there, I know that in El Sante, the development that you and Mike Cobb are, are building over in uh, in El Salvador, you can actually buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin. Can can you actually purchase stuff with Bitcoin, like a, a go to a store in Portugal? You're, you're starting to see more and more of that. I, I, I won't say it's as widespread as El Salvador. Remember, <clears throat> El Salvador came out in September and said, that it's legal current, it's legal tender. Yes. 
Yeah. So, so merchants must, you know, I mean, there's some exemptions given for people that live in very rural areas or don't have the ability to have like little crypto terminals or like the equipment they need. But essentially, you know, 80, 85 percent of all merchants in El Salvador <clears throat> accept crypto. It, it hasn't gotten to that level here, not only in Portugal, but the rest of Europe. But it's growing and it's certainly ahead of the U.S. <clears throat> I mean, uh, I just came to Portugal from Austria and uh, and, uh, you know, in Austria, I would say more than half the hotels you can pay in crypto. Um, you know, a small number of restaurants allow you to pay in crypto. So it's, you know, it's just gaining momentum. I think it's a it's a trend that's going to continue. I, I think, Joel, in a paper I read the other day, it might have been on uh, Yahoo News. They said something like eight to 10 percent of transactions in Portugal are now with Bitcoin. Eight to yeah, yeah, I, I think the U.S. is around five or six, I, some way down there. Yeah, and again, you know, with the with the favorable rules and, and laws in place, it's attracting people here who want to continue to, you know, you know, build that infrastructure. So I met with a very successful lawyer here yesterday um, in the crypto space, and he pulled up to have lunch in his, you know, five hundred thousand dollar. Um, over, <laughs> over the top Lamborghini, and I, 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 I commented on his car, and he said, "You know, what good is all this wealth if it's just little, you know, electronic bits in your computer?" He said, "I, you know, I want to enjoy my my money." So uh, it's funny because he and his wife are expecting their first child uh, in May, and I, I asked them if there was going to be room in the in the back of that thing for a car seat. I didn't see any. I didn't see any room for a car seat, but but you just see. I mean. Yeah. Portugal historically was was you know it was kind of like the ugly stepchild yes. of Europe. You know it. I mean it, it was neutral during the wars, right? Uh, both Hitler and Churchill supposedly had plans to move their government in exile to Portugal should their you know should their country be overrun by the other, uh, which was interesting. Um, there's an area outside of Lisbon they called um, you know it's like um, monarchy row because all of the former kings and queens of Europe as they were deposed, oh. the king of Italy, you know, some of the German kings, they all have their big mansions and estates in an area of town called uh, Kashkesh, which is just maybe 10 miles outside of uh, Lisbon on the coast. So, you know, it's, it's, it, but it was always kind of held back, right? It was kind of ostracized from from Europe um, you know they had a essentially a dictator for many many years what, what was a, his name what was his name I I, I re, doggone it when you said that <laughs> I oh man it, maybe it'll come to me it was years it wasn't as long as yeah, Franco yeah, next door was Spain. Spain. yeah Franco was Spain but uh, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll get it for you we'll, we'll talk about it again next week and yeah. I'll have the name for you I I was just reading yeah. about it not long ago, but it, it's uh, it's not coming to me right now. It's been a it's been a long day. My day started at four thirty, and now it's about nine p.m. So it's uh, well, been a long you. day. But but, you. but you know you know Portugal, it's on fire now. I mean, I think one of the reasons it pushed hard to join the EU was so that it would never go back to the kind of uh, dictatorship and yeah. you know military type government that it had. So they're, they're very progressive. They're very, you know, very much for European integration. Um, but they're, like I said, they're also a smaller country. They're more nimble. They could, they could move quicker. And um, the gap between Portugal is one of the poor European countries and say rich countries like, like Germany or Switzerland, uh, that, that gap is rapidly, rapidly closing. So, and I think, you know, they're, their policies, like their like their Bitcoin policies, and their uh, policies to attract retirees. I mean, what country would what, what what retiree would not want to be here? I mean, when I walked around the other day here, you know, it's it's not quite like Florida, right? It's not that warm, but it's about the closest thing that they have, at least in continental Europe. Right. So, you know, walking down one of the little boardwalks here, all the coffee shops, they're all filled with you know, retired Germans and Brits and they're 
they're sitting around enjoying the sunshine and they're spending their money. And the, the Algarve has 330 days a year of sunshine. So, you know, it means not over 90% of the time you're going to get sun and, you know, the, it's, you know, it's February and it's in the sixties. So, you know, what does that tell you? It might, might get in the fifties, but it really doesn't get any colder than that. So um, it's a great place for people to live, spend money. It's great for entrepreneurs, great for place for people to, you know, enjoy their wealth. Like the guy with his, uh, you know, with his Lamborghini. So, let, let me ask you this. You mentioned the entrepreneurs and you mentioned it several times. What is the atmosphere for entrepreneurs there in the U S now, you know, it, it's like after, after five years, barely 10% of new businesses make it. And it's because of the licenses and the permits and the taxes and government, government, government. How is it there? Does the gut now, now I interviewed, uh, Giovanni, whom you know in Nicaragua a couple of weeks ago, and a good friend of mine, businesswoman in Honduras, and they both said, we don't have that. Our government encourages entrepreneurship. What's the story for, for, for especially for the young people who watch it? I know we have a lot of them. Being able to go to that country and start a business without government doing this, the thumb, you know. Yeah. You know, it's it's a mixed bag, you know, and to be very honest with you, it's a mixed bag. You, you know, you have things like we were just talking about crypto. There, it's very hands off. I mean, the government's trying to encourage people to come. And, you know, it's, you know, as long as you're not doing anything illegal, you know, you can come and pretty much do do what you want. Uh, so a lot of the startup industries, the tech industries, investment areas are, are really uh, attractive. Some of the older um, industries tend to have more bureaucracy. It's kind of like this goes along with, uh, you know, the historical baggage. I, I noticed that there's a lot of bureaucracy around the tourism industry, which okay. I think they need to do a little more to unshackle some of that because I, I do think it's holding them back a little bit um, compared to, for example, Spain. Spain's very progressive. Uh, when it comes to the tourism in the tourism sector. Um, so, you know, it's it's a mixed bag. But, you know, the, the nice thing here is, you know, again, good weather, low cost of living. The wage rates are pretty low here still compared to, you know, northern Europe. So if you're if you're going to start a business and hire people, you know, you're going to get smart, educated people at a much lower cost than Germany, France and, and, and those right. countries. And, you know, in the areas where I, I have had to work through bureaucracy, you know, it's there. You have to work through it. But, you know, probably you're not going to do it by yourself. You probably need to hire a decent local lawyer who can kind of help you steer through it. So, you know, if, if, you, if you're hearing from Latin America, and I, I think I, I generally tend to agree with that, yeah. in a lot of the developing countries, um, they've just thrown regulations and bureaucracy out the window. That's not the case here in, in Portugal. You, you do have hoops and hurdles you have to jump through, but I wouldn't say it's oppressive. Um, somebody right. showed me in, in New York, if you want to open a restaurant, for example, in New York, there's a, 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 a manual you have to fill out. And I kid you not, it's over 400 pages of, of data and information and rules and regulations, you know, before you can even open on day one. I don't think it's anything close to that here, so. Well, well, you know, you and I both have homes in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, a liquor license for a restaurant is six hundred thousand dollars. What the heck? You know, to, to serve a bottle of booze. So, so you know, so it's got to be better in Portugal. So we for the for the young people might want to start a business. It it sounds very uh, welcoming. How about older people who moving there on a fixed income? Let, let's put, let's say the average, I think the average income for social security is around 2,300. Could yeah. you, could you live in Portugal on 2,300 a year, a, a month? A month. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you, you, you would, you would have to be, you know, cognizant of what your income was and where you lived. Right. So for example, we, I talked before about cash case outside of Lisbon, where, you know, all the ex royalty lives, you're, you're not going to live there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Could you live here in the Algarve where I am now? Yes, probably not directly on the ocean, but maybe a five minute walk from the ocean. I mean, nice. you know, you can find very reasonable housing. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Portuguese islands, for example, Madeira, the Azores. 
Uh, Portugal spends a lot of money subsidizing the um, importation costs of basic goods that, that come in every day on barges from the mainland. And it's really to keep the population there. You know, if they didn't do that, you would have mass exodus of, of people and sure. they don't want those islands to become unpopulated. I mean, the, the largest Azorian island is San Miguel. It has around 100,000 people. But there are a couple, you know, there's nine islands that comprise the Azores. And a few of them have like several hundred people and, and the population's diminishing. So, so they're doing a lot to keep the, the people there. And uh, they have very low taxes. I think they don't uh, levy um, VAT taxes on the islands. Or if they do, it's at a much, much lower rate than on the mainland. They subsidize things. So, you know, if, if you're looking for a mild climate and you want to be on an island, the other thing that's nice about the Azores, um, you know, it's you get on a plane in Boston and you're there in three and a half hours. I mean, it's only halfway to, it's only halfway to Europe. When I fly <laughs> from, you know, let's say Newark to Vienna, it's a 10 hour flight and you just you just feel really, you know, exhausted by the time you, you get there. But going to the Azores, no problem. If you want European culture, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we 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 went one summer to um, the Azores. And right before we went to the Azores, uh, we, we we went up to the Cape right outside of Boston. Right. And we spent more time in traffic trying to get to the Cape than we did line to the Azores. And it's the same geography, the same weather, same yeah. beach, same water. Uh, but you have a little bit more European flair. You know, you've got the the French uh, pastries and the, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it was, it was, it's nice. It's a nice uh, change. So, so yes, I think that I would say that 95% of, of Portugal is extremely affordable. It's probably one of the most affordable countries in Europe. You know, you, you could, you could probably be in some rural areas of, of Italy and maybe Greece uh, where it would be comparable or some Eastern European countries like Bulgaria. But I, I don't think you're going to have the mix of weather, food, people, education, healthcare. By the way, you know, the healthcare system here, if you're a resident, it's, it's free. I mean, you know, wow. I mean, it's, Wow. Um, and they have pretty, pretty darn good doctors. You, if you want to buy private insurance on top of the free system, you can do that. Um, I mean, I, I had to get a test here a couple of years ago and uh, they were preparing the, a bill for me. It was around going to be about 30 euros. And then all of a sudden, you know, I was giving her my documentation said, oh, you're, I didn't realize you're a resident here. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm have residents in Portugal. Said, oh well, then it's uh, it was like seventy cents or something instead of thirty euros because I was a resident. I no, would have been. I would have not be paid the, the thirty euros. It was you know in the states probably would have been three hundred dollars for the same right. test. So uh, I didn't mind at all. But you know, for a lot of people, that's one of the big worries and fears they have is that hey, what if something happens to me? I need medical care and it wipes out all of my all of my resources. So I, I have some clients that are here. They're on. You know, they're on pensions, they're on Social Security, but they don't have tons of resources. And that's one less worry they have uh, living in Portugal. Well, you know what? I'm glad we talked about Portugal I'm, because I know everything I knew about Portugal, I said at the opening of the conversation, so, yeah. <laughs> which was not much. I do know one thing, Straussner, right? Straussner was the name of the president of Portugal, I think, for all those years. I think he was. I think, I think he was president for like fifty years or something. It was. A, oh yeah, yeah. He, he and Franco. Yeah, yeah. It just came to me. honestly, God, folks. I did not look it up. I think it was Straussner, though. So, Joel, thank you. This has been fantastic. Yeah, it's great. I, I, yeah. I know uh, we had lots of other things to talk about, but it was yeah. fun talking about Portugal today. It's a easy thing for me to talk about because we we really do love it here. Um, and in the years ahead, we we may even. Uh, decide to apply for Portuguese citizenship. Um, we'll see. We haven't really made that decision yet, but I think it's a, it's a wonderful plan B uh, country. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, if you want to come and visit and spend some time here and you need, need somebody to help point you in the right direction, you know, reach out to our office. We'd be happy to help. Fantastic. You. Here we go. Nagel, let me hold up my sign. There you go. 
He just invited you folks. So right there's the number. All right, Joel, thank you very, very much. This has been great. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so much, especially when it's late at night over there. No so worries. Have, have, a, have a great rest of the week. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Outstanding, folks. Remember, this is America's number one asset protection attorney giving you some absolutely incredible advice, and he's there on the spot. You are there. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and we'll be back again uh, next Thursday with uh, Joel Nagel's uh, Global Wealth Fort Fortress Report. Thank you. Let's do, as I always say, let's do this thing. This is great. <laughs>